Good evening, everyone. So I'm very uh, happy to be here and part of this wonderful in um, initiative. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about um, new innovations in prenatal testing with particular focus on non-invasive prenatal testing, or NIPT. And I think most obstetricians uh, around the world would agree that NIPT is possibly the greatest innovation in obstetric practice. So first, why do we do prenatal testing? And Fergal already alluded to this. It's to answer the question when people arrive in the office, is my baby okay? And bearing in mind only about 2 to 3% of babies are affected with a structural or genetic issue, we are able to give reassurance in, to the vast majority of couples that we see. When we do detect an abnormality, there is no doubt that a prenatal diagnosis aids with optimising the outcome and the care that we can provide to patients. We know where to deliver them, what time to deliver them at, the correct mode of delivery. If there's fetal interventions like the laser we saw earlier on, um, we can do that. If we have identified factors that need to be dealt with immediately after delivery, that can be planned for also. We also want to inform our patients, to educate our patients, um, to avoid the shock in the delivery room. Um, and also, this is an emotional time for couples when an abnormality has been detected in their baby, so you want to be able to provide them as much information as possible and also support um, and counselling from all the different disciplines that can provide that. So we've heard a lot in the media the last couple of days about um, the older women having babies and also tonight. Um, and alongside that, there's increased need for further reassurance. And I think, again, that's a big factor when we're doing screening tests. I think over a third of our women are conceiving at the age of 35. And hand in hand with that, then there's more concern about chromosomal issues like Down syndrome. And Edgar already alluded to the fact that compared to a 25 year old, there's a significant job, jump in the risk of Down syndrome when you're over the age of 40. Bearing in mind, however, that there is still a low risk of chromosomal issues and no matter what age you are. When we talk about Down syndrome, we're talking about a trisomy 21. And trisomies are basically where there's an extra copy of a particular chromosome. We all have 23 pairs of chromosomes and we have an extra copy of 21. This is Down syndrome, okay? When it refers to chromosome 18, this is Edward syndrome you may have heard of, or when it's chromosome 13, this is Pato syndrome that you also may have heard of. When we're trying to detect these abnormalities, we have two approaches. We have a non-invasive approach, which is usually based around ultrasound, and also an invasive approach, which is more focused on a needle test that's more diagnostic. Ultrasound has advanced over the years, and it's certainly become an integral part of pregnancy management. And when you attend the rotunda, everyone gets a booking ultrasound. And with advanced technology, we're able to discern a lot more features. So when come, someone comes to their first ultrasound, you're looking to see that it's a viable pregnancy with a normal heartbeat. You want to see the pregnancy in the right place. You want to see that it's equal to dates. You also want to see that there's more, only one baby in there, or there could be more, two or even more. We also like to take the opportunity to have a look at the baby at this early stage, to make sure all the features are consistent with what you expect at that gestational age. And certainly if you saw any abnormalities, like on the top there, there's a large bladder. And the second uh, picture there, there's an absence of a cranial vault, which is anencephaly, so the, the type of spina bifida. Or in the third picture there, there's a cystic agroma where there's marked thickness at the back of the neck. If you pick up any of these factors, then you refer the people onto the prenatal diagnosis clinic for more expert um, evaluation and testing. We tend to focus more detailed ultrasound though at the 20 week scan or what's also called a routine scan or the anatomical survey. Um, and in the States that's called a genetic sonogram. And what we're looking for is details of assessing the baby from head to toe. Ultrasound is good, but it's not perfect. Um, you assume that you'd pick up most cases of spina bifida, cases like um, cleft lip, most tummy abnormalities, kidney abnormalities, but you do not detect everything. And when it comes to genetic issues like Down syndrome, you're relying on certain red flags or ultrasound markers to help guide you to assess the risk of whether this pregnancy is affected by something like that. Bearing in mind, about 30 to 50% of pregnancies with Down syndrome have no ultrasound abnormalities. So you can see how they could be easily missed based on ultrasound alone. You're kind of relying on the presence of a classic heart defect or the kind of double bubble sign with the, with the bowel defect to guide your interpretation of the ultrasound. If you're focusing then on um, genetic testing and screening, um, the one option is the first trimester scan. And the first trimester scan can be performed between 11 and 14 weeks gestation. And what you're doing is measuring the length of the baby from head to toe, or sorry, head to bottom. Um, you're also looking at the thickness at the back of the baby's neck. And you're combining that down with some blood parameters to assess the risk factor for 
the common chromosomal abnormalities, so the trisomy 21, trisomy 18, trisomy 13, and the detection rate is uh, almost 90%. So you may end up with a report. So we have here a 36-year-old lady who had a first trimester screen performed at 12 weeks. The nuchal size was relatively normal at 1.5 millimetres. She had a pre-test risk factor based on her age alone of about 1 in 179. But after the test, her risk factor then was reduced to 1 in 3,500, which is equivalent to a 15-year-old woman. This in itself is very reassuring. The issue arises when the risk factor is not as clear Normally, we say that someone is high risk if the risk is about 1 in 200, but there's still a 199 chance that of 200 so that everything is okay. So it's a difficult decision to decide to move from a blood test, and ultrasound <coughs> assessment, to a needle test, which is more diagnostic, that'll give you the yes-no answer. And the needle test we're talking about with something like a chorionic bit of sampling, where with ultrasound guidance, you're trying to get some placental tissue. And you can do this through the tummy, depending on the placental uh, location, or th with the straw through the cervix. This can be performed at 10 to 12 weeks gestation, but there is a concern because it can be associated with 1% fetal loss rate. The other option is an amniocentesis a little bit later, and um, that can be performed 15 to 18 weeks. Um, and with both tests, you're looking for fetal cells that you can culture and get a result within a couple of days with major chromosomal problems, and then within two to three weeks for all the chromosomes. I suppose the, the, the concern, however, is that you're potentially doing a needle test and disturbing a potentially healthy pregnancy. So you, you want to be absolutely justified that you're doing this needle test for the right reason. So it's been a long-standing desire to come up with a test that's going to give you as accurate a result as possible and avoid the need for a needle. And I suppose our dreams were realized when Professor Lowe in um, 2007 discovered cell-free DNA in the, maternal, in the maternal blood. So basically that the baby's DNA is circulating in the maternal blood detectable from about four to five weeks um, of pregnancy timing um, and it's cleared immediately after delivery so that if you know if you're testing this DNA that you're testing the current pregnancy. It wasn't until there was advanced genetic uh, um, testing with sequencing that was, we developed the capability of testing this baby's DNA in your blood to detect the presence of whether the baby had chromosomal uh, issues like an extra chromosome 21, <coughs> chromosome 18 or chromosome 13. Now, I'm sorry, I'm going to give you a little bit of science here, but just to explain, as I said, you've got two pairs of each chromosome, so you expect that, say, for chromosome 21, in the maternal DNA, there's two copies. There'll also be two copies in the fetal DNA, but you're then looking for a very minute proportion of increased uh, chromosome 21 in the fetal DNA, which is very small compared to the overall DNA in the blood. So it's very technically challenging. So it wasn't until massive parallel sequencing where they're able to replicate sequences of genes billions of times to garner enough information that they actually do this testing. So for us, this was a big innovation. However, as clinicians, we were playing catch up. So a number of companies within a couple of years were launching these tests onto the market, doing the same kind of testing. And from 2011, 2012, and we had a number of companies fighting for patency, fighting against each other with this advanced technology. And by 2012, there was over 150 tests done worldwide in over 50 countries. So we as clinicians were playing catch up with this advanced technology, but also wondering, was this test delivering as an accuracy that was being promised? And thankfully, over a number of years, there's been a number of validation studies done in high-risk women, and thankfully, the test is very accurate. So for the detection of trisomy 21, the sensitivity was 99%. So, uh, and the specificity is even better at 99.9%. And from a screening point of view, the detection of trisomy 18, 13 and Turner syndrome are better than any other test that we've ever encountered before. So now we have a blood test, a simple blood test. So this lady here had a blood test at 11 weeks. She was able to find out the gender of her baby. And they have a result here that documents that her risk of the major chromosome abnormalities is less than one in 10,000. So that's very, very reassuring. On the flip side, if you get a high risk result, you'd be fairly confident that the, uh, the, the risk associated here is 99%. So it's fairly certain that, um, that, that this baby is affected. So there's an, it, it reduces the amount of uncertainty. Now, this is a fantastic test. It's almost approaching diagnostic capabilities, but at the end of the day, it's still a screening test. So it is not diagnostic. We still need to do a needle test to confirm if you get a high risk result. 
And we've known this over the last couple of years because of the potential of false positivity. So where a test has come back positive, where in fact the fetus or the baby is not actually affected. And a no, number of studies and case studies have been reported. And the different reasons this can occur include that the abnormality is confined to the placental tissue, that there may have been a vanishing twin or an early twin pregnancy that was not detected, um, or that the abnormality is originating from the maternal chromosomes or indeed um, a, a tumour, which it, it itself is very, very rare. The other issue that's arisen is the importance of the fetal fraction, and this means the amount of baby DNA or fetal DNA that's actually in the maternal blood system. And ideally, the companies would, would prefer a, a fetal DNA rate of between 8 to 10 percent to provide an accurate testing, but there are a number of factors that can affect this. Obviously, the fetal DNA can be affected by the size of the baby, so obviously increases as the um, pregnancy in increases and also can be diluted by the increasing size of, of women also. So there are a few factors that kind of affect the amount of DNA that's detected in the, in the maternal system. The other issue is that there is a no-call rate or failure um, in about 4 to 6 percent of these tests, and they could be for a myriad of reasons, and normally they recommend that you have a second test performed. If the second test, again, doesn't give you um, a, a, a result, and this is attributed to a low fetal fraction, there is a concern that the risk is more because this baby might actually be affected by a chromosomal issue and they certainly recommend genetic investigations um, and further counselling to, to guide you in the right way. So we have a number of companies offering the same test. Um, just from a practical point of view, it is an opt-in test. It's not part of routine practice, so there is a cost involved. It can be performed from nine to 10 weeks of gestation onwards. Ultrasound at the time of the test is very, very important. It's, it's important to confirm that the pregnancy is viable. It's important to d discern if there's one baby or more than one baby there. The gestation and age is important. And also, you want to be able to rule out any significant abnormalities like I showed you earlier on. If you're able to see some, um, some significant like a cystic aroma, which we know is associated with the 50% risk of chromosomal issues, if you've already this high risk, then doing a non-invasive screening test may not be the best option. And maybe you should opt for a diagnostic test to skip that step. Also, it's for important to be informed about your suitability for the type of test. The companies offer the same kind of testing, but there is slight variations in the technology. For example, the Harmony test compare the baby's DNA to a, a reference gene, a gene, so a standard chromosome in the lab, whereas Panorama, say, compare the chromosome 21 to your own chromosome in your blood. So for um, certain circumstances for that case, you wouldn't be able to test for twins or if you've egg, egg donation or bone marrow transplantation that the harming test would be more appropriate for you. But certainly getting appropriate counselling before you embark on a test, they can guide you about which test is more appropriate for you. It takes 10 to 12 working days to get a result back, but a lot of the labs are based in California present and we're hoping when they're moving to mainland Europe that the lag time will be improved for um, getting a result. Bear in mind again, 99% of patients will get a reassuring result. Um, on the form, you need to specify if you want to know gender. And again, the detection rates are very high. 99% for Down syndrome, 80% for Hepato syndrome, 98% for trisomy 18, and 86% for sex chromosomes. These are very, very good um, uptake rates. If there is a high-risk result, though, it's absolutely necessary that you do an invasive test to confirm the result for the factors I outlined earlier. And if there's an insufficient sample, repeat uh, sampling is required. And if there's recurrent no-call results, then alternate testing may be, uh, may be required. So beyond the uh, testing for these kind of common chromosomal abnormalities, the labs are developing um, expansion of their panels. And there is a focus now on microdeletions. So instead of having an extra chromosome, this is where part of a chromosome can be missing, and they're losing some genetic material. And the focus on these chromosomes or these microdeletions is because individually they're very rare, but as a group they can be almost as common as some of the common chromosomal abnormalities, and they're not age dependent. There's particular focus on DeGeorge syndrome, um, as this can be associated with heart defects um, and cleft palate. Um, and, but also the main issue here is that early interventions and diagnosis can affect the prognosis and, and management of the baby after it's born. We at the Rotunda are part of the SMART study with Natira. Um, that's one of the, the groups that are performing the NAPT test. And unlike lab-based tests that they've been performed previously, which are not as accurate, this is a population study, so we're hoping to validate this test in our population. 
Um, our patients that enrolled in the study um, have the George testing done um, uh, without any extra cost and actually by enrolling the, the NPT overall is, is at a cheaper cost than normal. We think it's important to be involved in this kind of study because it keeps us abreast of all the advances that are happening and it lets us inform us our, our, our population of our patients uh, to the best of our ability. In the background though, these labs continue to evolve the testing and some labs have already um, devised the capability of doing full gene testing on the baby's DNA in the blood. But a lot of people have problems with this. Um, there's concerns with whether this is appropriate, there's ethical concerns, <coughs> and there's also concerns about how to interpret this and how to counsel patients appropriately about is this amount of information absolutely necessary. So in conclusion, screening on the vast majority of cases provides reassurance. Um, ultrasound continues to play a very, very important role, and this test should not be done without um, concurrent ultrasound evaluation. From, from, from a chromosomal point of view, NIPT is, a, without a shadow of doubt, the best screening test available, but informed consent is, is appropriate. Um, the limitations need to be um, explained, and also the need for follow-up in certain circumstances needs to be arranged also. There's no doubt that NIPT is here to stay, and it's going to continue to evolve so we need to watch this space. Thank you very much for your attention.